Well, we've seen everything there is to see about logic gates. That's why now we can actually move on to look at the bigger and more interesting components. You're watching episode 6 of Logic Components. So what we're going to do is today we're going to start with one of the more advanced components but we're going to start with the simplest of the lot. But before we actually begin, I do want to actually recap one of the concepts that I shared with you in the first episode and that is the entire idea behind actually using bits to represent a number. Because we're actually now moving on to look at some more complicated components that actually use numbers as an input at one point or another, it is important we know how numbers work in binary. So just to quickly recap, you can think of a binary string as a set of on and off switches for a whole bunch of different weights. If it's 1, then that particular weight has been switched on. To get the value, what you want to do is you actually want to look at all the switched on weights and add them together. Now, here's another concept that we didn't really cover in the first episode. Well, to count in binary, it's actually very similar to counting in any other number system. So let's say we're counting up in decimal, we have a particular digit that we can keep counting up, but eventually it'll hit a limit. If we're counting in decimal, the limit will be 9. There is no single digit larger than 9. So in order to represent the number 1 bigger, what we do is we overflow this back to 0, and we insert a new digit in front of it. So you can think of the second digit in a tens place as a counter for the number of times the first digit has overflowed. Extend this concept to every digit, Basically, every digit is a counter of the number of overflows of the digit before it. In binary, the same concept holds. When you have a binary number, every single digit can only be 0 or 1. So overflows happen all the time. You start off with 0, and then you have 1, and then when you want to increment it further, it overflows. And as a result, you get 1, 0. If you understand the concept, you should understand why the numbers work like this. What you're seeing on screen right now is counting up decimal numbers and binary numbers simultaneously. So both representations you see on either side of the screen actually represent the exact same value. Having understood that, we can now move on to actually take a look at encoders and decoders. So this is the first logic component that is somewhat more complicated than a gate that we're going to look at. Now we're going to start with an encoder. So the idea of an encoder is this. You have a whole bunch of inputs, but what you're going to do is you're going to map it to a smaller output. Let's take a look at how this can be done. What you're seeing on screen is an 8 to 3 encoder. What this means is, it takes 8 inputs and produces a 3-bit output. But how will this work? You see, the inputs are treated as 8 separate 1-bit inputs, which we will label as input number 0 through to 7. You may only turn on one of these inputs, and what you get for output is a number representing which input you've turned on. So what you're seeing now is a simulation of a component called a priority encoder, but disregard that for a moment, we'll come to that in a bit. Watch what happens as I switch the inputs on and off one by one, and observe the corresponding output. Now, do note that when all my inputs are false, the output is actually invalid, but otherwise, the counter changes as you would expect. Incidentally, what you've just seen is a simulation done in a program called Logisim. It's a very fun program, I highly recommend you check it out. If you've ever wanted to do any hands-on tests with logic gates, well, Logisim is a good place to go. As we move on in this series, you will start to learn about more and more different components that are available in Logisim, and that will probably enhance the fun factor you have playing with the different components. So anyway, let's get back to our encoder. Now, similarly to the logic gates we've already seen, encoders also have truth tables. However, we get to take some liberties when drawing them. Depending on what kind of encoder we're talking about, the number of inputs could be humongous. For the 8 to 3 encoder we've already seen, we technically have 256 unique input combinations. But luckily, we don't have to draw them all, since the vast majority of them are actually invalid. How so? because there is more than one input set to 1. By disregarding those input combinations, our truth table is left with just 8 rows. All the rows on the left are simply entries with just a single 1 in them. 
and the outputs are binary representations of the numbers 0 through the 7. But can we do better? Can we create an encoder that doesn't have so many invalid inputs? Yes, we have put on the restriction that we should only switch on one of the inputs at a time. But what happens if we switch on multiple inputs? Now, the way an encoder is actually wired means that if you switch on multiple inputs, then the output is actually meaningless. You could get some form of unpredictable output because of the invalid input condition. So that kind of sucks, right? Because now you have, you know, some means of actually injecting user error, which is why we look at a related component called the priority encoder. Now, a priority encoder functions basically exactly like your standard encoder, except now it can actually take in multiple bits that are switched on. That's not to say it actually factors them in, it actually ignores them. Instead, what it actually does is it looks for the largest value that you've switched on. So basically, if we were to label our inputs input 0 to input 7, then the largest input that was switched on will be the one that is actually taken as a result. So it doesn't matter if I have input 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 all switched on, the output is going to be 5 because the value taken is the largest input value. And with regard to its truth table, the priority encoder has a truth table very similar to that of the encoder. The difference being that half the zeros have been replaced with little x's. We read each x as don't care, meaning that that line in a truth table will be equally valid regardless of whether the x's were replaced with ones or zeros. This of course falls in line with how a priority encoder works. So right, that's your encoder and priority encoder. So what is a decoder? Well, you should probably be able to infer that this is just an inversion of what the encoder actually does. So instead of taking, well, individual values as inputs and then producing a number as output, a decoder actually takes a number for input and it actually switches on one of the values depending on what number you give it. So now the truth table kind of looks different because your input is now just a single value and then for the output, you simply just switch on one of all the output bits and which output you choose is determined by the input number. And there you have it. That is basically your encoder, priority encoder, and your decoder. That pretty much wraps it up for this episode of Logic Components. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, remember that I appreciate every like, favorite, and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And for more updates outside of YouTube, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at 0612TV. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.